What is up everybody and welcome back to the channel for another episode in the Ask Me Anything series. The trade deadline is officially a thing of the past, so there's no shortage of things to talk about. And as always, you guys absolutely killed it with the questions. So I do want to give a huge shout out to everybody that took the time to come up with a question and leave it on the post. Even the ones that don't get featured in the video, just know I read every single one and I appreciate all of you guys. I also wanted to say thank you for all the support you guys showed on the trade deadline coverage videos the week leading up to the deadline and then the deadline deadline review itself. March has been a fantastic month so far, so I wanted to say thank you guys for that. If you guys enjoy these Ask Me Anything videos and you want another episode next Monday, then be sure to leave this video a like. Let's see if we can hit 700 likes on this episode. And if this is your first time checking out the channel and you want NHL content just like this all year round, hit that subscribe button. And with that all being said, let's go ahead and start off with the first question from Crane Hook, who says, no word of confirmation yet, but how worried would you be about Vancouver if Demko has a serious slash lengthy injury? Since you asked this question, Question, it has been reported that the expected timeline is two to three weeks. Obviously, that's not ideal, but he'll be back for the playoffs, and that's the most important thing. Thatcher Demko has obviously played a massive part in the fantastic season the Canucks have had up until this point, but they've built themselves a pretty solid cushion. They're 10 points up of Edmonton for first place in the Pacific Division. Even with Demko out for the next two to three weeks, they are not in jeopardy of missing the playoffs or anything like that. The main thing is the Canucks let him take the time he needs to get 100% healthy because to go on a lengthy playoff run, the Canucks are going to need Demko at 100%. You don't want to rush him back too soon, have him tweak something, and then have this injury linger on into the playoffs. It was also reported that this injury is not something that Thatcher Demko has dealt with in the past, which is fantastic news as well. Casey DeSmith has been serviceable enough this season for the Canucks when called upon, so I think he should be able to hold down the fort until Demko comes back. The next question we have comes from Hugh Barkers, who says, any thoughts on Tortorella's epic meltdown in Tampa? I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on this. It's not something that's all that surprising to see from somebody like John Tortorella. I thought it was really cool of Danny Breer to back up John Tortorella, and he came out and said he wants a coach that's going to defend his team and that he would pay any of the fines given to Tortorella, and Tortorella was in fact fined $50,000 and also suspended two games. The two-game suspension surprised me a little bit. I mean, we've seen some pretty dirty plays from NHL players only get, you know, $5,000 fines and things like that. So the fact that Tortorella was suspended two two games for unsportsmanlike conduct shocked me a little bit, but I think a lot of that stems from the fact that he stayed on the bench for like an extra minute after he was asked to leave. You have to think if an NHL player was ejected and they stayed on the ice for a whole minute after being ejected and continued to yell at the refs and berate them, they probably would be suspended as well. Moving along now to the next comment, this one comes from Hall of Fame Chipmunk who says, who do you think is winning the Western Conference after all the trades Vegas made? The playoffs in the Western Conference is going to be an absolute bloodbath. Obviously, teams like like Vegas and Colorado really loaded up. Winnipeg made some big moves as well, acquiring Tyler Toffoli and Sean Monahan like a month or so before the deadline. I feel like Vancouver is getting overlooked quite a bit, despite the fact that they are actually first in the entire Western Conference. The Dallas Stars, I don't think they're getting the respect they deserve. They currently sit first place in the entire Central Division. Sure, they might not have made the high profile moves like a Colorado, Vegas, and even Vancouver getting Lindholm or Winnipeg getting Toffoli, but they added a legit top four defensive defense in Chris Tanev, who makes their blue line that much deeper, and I kind of view Logan Stankoven as a deadline addition from within. They called him up, and he has been dynamite for the Dallas Stars since his call-up. You have to imagine he's going to be playing for them for the remainder of the season and into the playoffs. The Edmonton Oilers, outside of their disastrous start to the season, they've been one of the best teams in the NHL. I think there's honestly six teams in the West that have a legit shot to make it out of the conference and go to the Stanley Cup Finals. Now, that being said, even though I think there's six teams that could do it, obviously only one team can do it and is going to do it. So you asked for my prediction. And I think at this point, I'm honestly going to go with the Dallas Stars. In my opinion, that team is just built perfectly to go on a very deep playoff run. You have the star goalie in Jake Ottinger. You have the star defenseman in Miro Haskin. You have star forwards like Robertson and Hintz. It is very difficult to pinpoint a weakness when it comes to the Dallas Stars. They're deep up front. They're deep on the back end. They have a good mix of veterans who have been there, done that, have been on deep playoff runs in the past, but also a lot of very good 
young players who are hungry and driven to prove themselves in the postseason. The next question we have comes from Dusty NHL, who says, Do you see Bo Byron becoming a top 25 defenseman in the league in a couple years if he is paired with Dahlin or Power? He's got so much offensive potential, and I think playing with someone like a Dahlin or Power could really help his production, especially if he gets PP time. And also really appreciate the kind words, and I'm glad you liked the videos. Top 25 defenseman, that's, you know, a pretty high standard to set, but there is a reason he was drafted fourth overall back in 2019. This is a defenseman with a ton of upside, like you said, especially offensive upside. His defensive game has been pretty inconsistent throughout his career. Obviously, he's dealt with his fair share of injuries, but one thing that's remained relatively consistent when he's been healthy is his offensive production. The only thing about him potentially getting an opportunity to play with a Dahlin or a Power is one of the three would have to play on their offside. They're all left shot defensemen. You have to imagine Buffalo at least plans on experimenting with using one of those guys on the right side at some point in the future. I do feel like it may be hard for Bo and Byram to truly break out playing, you know, on a third pair. I do expect Byram to get pretty consistent looks on the power play in Buffalo. I think that's somewhere where Byram can really thrive. Most power plays in the NHL use four forwards and one defenseman, but with these three guys in Buffalo, I definitely think whether it's on the first unit or second unit, we're going to see them, you know, show a power play look with two defensemen. The Colorado Avalanche, the team Bo and Byram came from, he oftentimes played on their second unit with two other defensemen. So the Avalanche had three defensemen out there on the power play, which is something that we really don't see in the NHL, but I think that speaks to, you know, all the offensive upside that Bo and Byram has. They just didn't want to leave him off the power play, so they had him out there with both Gerard and Tays at times. If Byram gets the consistent minutes and he can stay healthy, I definitely think this is a defenseman that could get you, you know, upwards of 50 points in a season. If he's able to reach that kind of production and his defensive game can take strides in the right direction, then I don't think top 25 is out of the question. This next question comes from Drew NYE, who says, right now, who's the team that's in a playoff spot you don't think will make the playoffs and one team who isn't in the playoffs that you think can make it? I remember answering almost the same question early in the season. It was obviously a lot easier to answer them because things were still wide open, but now that we're kind of in that final stretch towards the playoffs, things are really tightening up in regards to the playoff race. I'll be honest, I think the Western Conference, the eight teams that are making it are set in stone. I can't see any of the teams that are currently in a playoff spot in the West fall out. The race in the Eastern Conference for those last couple of playoff spots is definitely a little bit closer than the West. We just saw the New York Islanders overtake the Detroit Red Wings for one of those wildcard spots. I think the Washington Capitals definitely still have a chance. They're only three points back out of a wildcard spot and only five points back from Philly for third place in the Metro. The Capitals have been a difficult team to play against all season long. They're getting really strong goaltending from Charlie Lindgren. Alex Ovechkin is starting to heat up, so I definitely don't think the Capitals should be counted out at this point. To answer your question, I feel like the only answers really would be the Islanders would be the team to fall out and either Detroit or Washington, the team to overtake them for a wildcard spot. I really can't see any team aside from Washington or Detroit making it that's not in a playoff spot right now. And with the way the Red Wings are playing right now, I know they're ahead of Washington in the standings currently, but I think Washington probably has a better shot of making it than Detroit does at this point. Speaking of the Red Wings, this next question comes from Jake, who says, what is going on with the Red Wings? Seriously, how do they go from legit contenders no one wants to play in round one to point night team other teams can't wait to play in the span of two weeks. It definitely has been a depressing stretch of games for the Red Wings. Like two weeks ago, they were eight points up of teams chasing them in the wildcard hunt. And now just like that, they find themselves on the outside looking in. These hot and cold stretches really have been the story of the Red Wings season. They've been super inconsistent. I don't think there's been a time where they're just playing all right. They've either been really good or really bad. And right now they're playing really bad. They're a team looking to get back into the playoffs for the first time in seven seasons. They're in the thick of a wild card hunt. These kind of cold stretches just can't happen, especially at this point in the season when other teams like the Islanders who were chasing the Red Wings are playing so well. In my opinion, there are two main factors that have really gone into this current cold streak that the Red Wings are on. Number one, Alex Lyon has definitely cooled down. It seems like the heavy workload is really starting to get to him, and that's not his fault. This is a guy who came into this season as the Red Wings' third string goalie. The most games he's played in a single season prior to this year was 15, and that was last year at the Panthers. Lions already played 32 this year. I think Lion has already given the Red Wings much more than they ever could have asked for this season. It's just a shame they can't really rely on anybody else to give them quality starts. Vili Huso's been injured so much this season. James Reimer hasn't been the greatest. And the second reason for this cold streak, and I think it's the biggest reason, Dylan Larkin's injury. This team is only going to go as far as Dylan Larkin takes them. He is the engine that runs this team. He drives the offense. He's one of their better defensive forwards. Without Dylan Larkin, this team takes a massive hit 
it in pretty much every aspect of the game. It feels like this Larkin injury in this recent stretch of games has been a big reality check and it goes to show how far the Red Wings are away from being a legit Stanley Cup contender and being, you know, a team in the upper echelon of the NHL. When other contending teams, you know, have an injury to one of their key players, their entire season doesn't just fall apart. Now, there is a pocket of people on Twitter, I feel like specifically a pocket of Red Wings fans, at least that are, you know, conspiracy theorists and believe in curses that think this whole recent stretch of losses is because the Red Wings finally put an advertisement on their jersey. The losing streak literally started right when that happened. They have yet to win a game with an advertisement on the jersey, which is kind of funny. I'm definitely not going to sit here and count the Red Wings out. They're still right there in the thick of the wildcard hunt, and they do have a favorable schedule to close out the season, but that means nothing if you don't win the game. So they got to start picking up points, and they got to do it now. Moving along now to the next question. This one comes from Brandon, who says, kind of hockey related. What are your thoughts of the prices for a Connor Bedard rookie? Worth it or all hype? And also really appreciate the kind words, and I'm glad you enjoy the videos. Yeah, to any of my hockey card collectors out there, seeing the prices of Connor Bedard rookie cards is pretty insane. Like, it's just base young gun card was selling for over 1500 when it was first released. Now, that's almost always the case when products first come out. You know, the card prices are way up, but this has definitely been the most extreme example of that. If you're going to buy a Connor Bedard young gun or you're going to buy boxes to try to pull them, I would honestly wait till the summer when there's no hockey going on. The prices are going to come down. I don't care how good Connor Bedard has been as a rookie. Listen, I'm somebody who thinks he's going to be, you know, the face of the NHL one day. He's going to be a generational talent, but there's just absolutely no way a Connor Bedard young gun should be going for more than a Connor McDavid one. And now finally finishing out the episode with the last question from Jordan, who says, which trade deadline acquisition has the biggest impact compared to their price? And also really appreciate the kind words and I'm glad you enjoy the videos. I talked about what was, in my opinion, one of the best bang for your buck trade acquisitions of the deadline in a video yesterday, and that is Vladimir Tarasenko for the Florida Panthers. A third and a fourth is a steal for Tarasenko, and it's only a small sample size. He's only played a couple of games, but it looks like he's going to be a beautiful fit. Another trade that I really liked and I think could end up looking like a steal is the Avalanche acquiring Yakov Trenin from the Nashville Predators for prospect Jeremy Hansel and a third round draft pick. Yakov Trenin is an absolute beast of a bottom six forward. I think he's going to wreak havoc in the playoffs for the Colorado Avalanche. I don't think it's going to be long before he comes a fan favorite for that team. I think he could be like, you know, the Blake Coleman, Barclay Goudreau kind of addition of this year's trade deadline where those guys were so good in the bottom six for Tampa Bay in their playoff runs. I think Trenton could have a similar impact for the Avalanche. So that is going to wrap up this week's episode of the Ask Me Anything series. Like I mentioned at the beginning, huge shout out and thank you to all of you that participated and left a question on the post. Even the ones that don't get featured in the video, I read every single one. I appreciate all of you guys. You all make these interactive videos so much fun for me to do. If you guys enjoyed this episode and you want another next Monday, then be sure to leave this video a like. That is definitely the best way to show your support. It helps out the videos a ton. And most importantly, if this was your first time checking out the channel and you want NHL content just like this all year long, hit that subscribe button and I'll talk to you all again soon.